So yeah, so my name is, uh, well, well, first of all, welcome uh, to the entire Fencing community, whoever's listening, watching. Uh, Andrew, Andrew's got like tons of followers, so I know it's a lot of people are gonna be uh, taking a look at this. Uh, but uh, my name is Ivan Lee, for those of you who don't know me, I've uh, been in the sport of fence for almost 30 years. I fenced a long time. Uh, I had a pretty decent career, made an Olympic team, a couple of world championship teams, uh, a few national titles, NCAA titles. Uh, referee for 20 years, I did several national championships, NCAA championships as a referee. Uh, and now I'm doing a little coaching. I coach uh, women's fencing at Long Island University and I coach Sabre at Long Island Fencing Center out in Carl Place. So uh, that's my current involvement in the sport. I'm gonna be starting veteran competition uh, as I'm turning 40 next year. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and yeah, so that's my, that's my current involvement in the sport. So today we're gonna talk about uh, you know, just mindset uh, going into a bout. Uh, my mindset is different for five touches, uh, 15 touches. When, when, when I'm going into a five touch bout, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, an ambush mentality. You just go in, destroy your opponent and get out, keep it moving. Um, it's all a matter of gathering information as quickly as you can and then executing actions, parry pose, attack and preparation, distance, long attack, things like that. Um, my experience is that when you try to grind it out and just keep going simultaneous, 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 bad things happen, right? Your opponent ends up being the one taking, taking the initiative. action. Exactly. Carrying you. Um, so you got to be very brave and you have to go for a ton of actions early on. Uh, in 15 touches, my mindset is slightly so wait, different. Before we before we get into that, sure. you, you said that you gather information uh, Quickly, mm -hmm. what kind of information are you trying to gather? Sure. So, so the way I gather information, and, and many different fences, I'm sure they gather information differently. But the way I gather information from my phone is through simultaneous actions. Um, I try never to do, you know, more than one in a row, maybe two in a row. But it's usually because I try to do something different, and then maybe the referee just calls simultaneous, but it wasn't right. intention. Yeah. But I. You know, usually after one simultaneous, I get a lot from my opponent. So the first thing I'll get is, um, you know, where my opponent's cutting. And that obviously is the most important thing. If you know where your opponent's going to cut, you know, if you're, if you're a trained fencer and you have a trained eye to, to, to take a good parry post, and you know where your opponent's going to cut, I mean, for me, I, I win most of my bouts. Nine, nine out of ten of my bouts, I win if I know where my opponent's going to cut most of the time. Mm -hmm. right? That just makes life a lot. Because me, I don't, you know, especially now in my older age, I, I don't want to run up and down the strip anymore. When I was a kid, anyone who saw me fence when I was a kid, when I was high school, college, I'd run all day long. I don't want to run anymore, right? I'm getting older. So if I know where you're going to cut, I'll stand on the guard line and take parry pose all day. Bang, 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 if I know where you're going to cut. Uh, so, you know, get, trying to figure that out early on is huge, right? If, if I can figure out where my opponent likes to cut in a five-touch bout, Makes my life a lot easier. My, yeah. my, my, I'm going to be nervous regardless, but, you know, my nervous level, it kind of goes down a little bit. My confidence goes up a little bit because I'm like, I calm down. But okay, I already know this guy's going to keep cutting to my four. <sighs> I can take a deep breath, just start going for fake parables, fake parables. You know, I can do that all day. I actually, I see a hesitation. Or I can switch to, to counterattack. Yeah, I used, I used to fence somebody at Nax who I literally never lost to. And the way the bout would go was he he would always have, like, total control of the situation. But I don't think he realized that he just finished a three every single time. So it, it didn't matter how screwed I was. Like, I'd be on the end of the strip and just completely off balance and just, like, three parry. And... Yeah. yeah. Because you know they're going to cut there. Exactly. It's life easy. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's probably the first thing that I try to figure out right away. So through simultaneous, I, you know, I, I've kind of figured out that most fences cut to the same place from the first touch, the last touch, and whenever they need a touch. Because that's yeah. their comfort spot. Yes, right? exactly. Those fences are like, very few fences are, are methodical with the way they cut. They intentionally cut to the head one time. Cut to the four the next time. Cut to the three the next time. Cut underneath the next time. Cut with the point the next time. Like, very few fences mix it up. Mm -hmm. Most fences go to the same place the majority of the time. Most fences. Yeah. So, once you figure that out, it makes life a lot easier. And I, and I don't think a lot of coaches teach that. I don't think a lot of fences even think about that when they're fencing. Uh, I think they pay attention to other things. But I think if you can figure that out, it, it, it makes life so much easier for you. Yeah, totally. So, that's my 
try to do during the bout early on. I try to figure out where's my opponent going to cut. The second thing I want to figure out through the simultaneous is how quickly is my opponent moving, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, is this, are they starting slowly and looking to, you know, make, making full sword before they attack or are they looking to attack right away? So I can figure that out as well. Um, and then the next thing I want to know is, you know, what kind of reach this person has, right? Yeah. Like, do they need advanced lunch to hit me? Do they need a double advanced lunch to hit me? You know, like, so what, and, and then also I can figure out, is this person going to be brave or is this person going to be, you know, a little more, te- uh, a little hes- hesita- hesitant, uh, a little bit more reserved? Is this person going to allow me the opportunity to, to, to attack early on or are they looking to take the initiative early on? So mm-hmm. I, get all, I can get all that up. Off the first simultaneous, um, and in a five touch bout, I really am not focused on all the other things. Don't want ancillary to me. My main goal is just figure out where they're gonna cut. Once yeah. I know where you're gonna cut, make it easy because my my next thought is parry post immediately. Like I don't even try to hide that when I fence. So like I let my opponent know I'm going to the parry. You know, if you if you if you decide you want to take an extra step or faint cut, it's gonna be so obvious because I'm sitting on the parry that I can change automatically. Like, I, I trust my ability to change, but I'm sitting on you cutting straight every single time. And every time you cut straight, I'm ready to take that parry. I'll adjust if necessary, but if, if not, I'll go for the parry every touch. So, especially in a five-touch bout. So, I try to set that tone early on. And if, and 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 honestly, if sometimes when I, especially with a good fencer, I want my opponent to know exactly what I'm doing. Because that'll make my opponent feel comfortable doing what he likes to do. Mm-hmm. And I want to know what he likes to do because <laughs> that gives me more information. So if I know that my opponent saying, okay, well, he's going to go for the parry, how, how is he going to adjust to my, my parries? Is he going to do bank cut? Is he going to add an extra step? Is he going to bounce up and down? I need to know that. Mm-hmm. I know exactly which counterattack I'm going to use. You know, am I going to counterattack and move backward? Am I going to do a counterattack in preparation? Am I going to do a counterattack with distance? There's many different types of counterattack. So, which way am I going to stop? Am I going to counterattack to the arm because he does multiple feints and makes a technical mistake with his hand? Is he pulling his hand back this way so I have to counterattack to the head? Whatever it is, I got to figure that out. So, so um, I really, I really like the way that you mentioned that even though he's he's getting around your parry, there's different ways that a person can do that, and there's different ways to deal with it. A lot of the time, when I talk to people about their bout, and I ask them like what was happening, and they'll just say something like, "I kept trying to go for parry and it wasn't working." But, like, mm-hmm. why wasn't it working? There are so many different reasons why. And based on what the reason is, your response is totally different. And I feel like a lot of people don't don't know how to break it down, like, why they're losing touches. Just what just what is happening and not exactly why. So, that's right. definitely exactly. a skill. Exactly. The why, the why is the key. Exactly. For a lot of things, you have to know why. It's very easy to say my parent wasn't working. Yes. Most of the time, there's nothing wrong with your parrot. There's nothing wrong with your ability to take a parrot. Mm-hmm. It's just that you have an opponent who has a brain. It yeah. could be a good brain. It could be a slow brain. It might not be the best brain in the world. But if they're, but if you're not parrying your opponent, there's something that they're doing right. Probably. There's something you're not doing right. So you have to figure out why. Yeah. You have to answer the question. Why is my parrot not working? Is it because I'm an inch too short or, an inch or, or a second too quickly? Uh, a second too slowly, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, what is it that I'm doing? I could be an inch off. I could be a second off. I could be a, a, a foot too close, uh, a foot too far. I, you know, it could be it could be minor things. Or it could be the referee's just not seeing it. Mm-hmm. You know, that could be the thing too. So you got to figure out exactly what the, the reason is why something's not working. And once you figure out why, then you can come up with a solution. And, and you have to do all that. The time the referee says, on guard. Yeah. Right? So, so again, like, if you fall on that page, you know, and, and I know a lot of fall on that page like to say, oh, Sabre fences have more time. No, you may have a clock. You have a clock, and we don't. But you have time to set up an action to fall on that page. Yeah, while we you're do moving around. Yeah. Yeah, you can break the distance and come back. Say we don't have that op- that option. We don't have that luxury. Yeah. I can't just break this. Okay, let's let's get back into it. No. Or if I break the distance, my corner's running at me. Yeah, exactly. You know, I have to think on the fly. So we don't have that advantage. Um, and even though there is no clock, I know full and epic fences. They might feel like they're under the pressure when it's thirty seconds or twenty seconds, and they might be down a touch or two. And I understand all that. 
But, you know, if you have an impatient saber referee who says, okay, left touch on guard, yep. and they're not letting you walk to the end of the strip and, and take three seconds to think, you got to think on the fly. Yep. I got to think while I'm getting the guard. And if not, then I have to figure out how to tie my shoelaces, how to fix my, my non-existent hair. Yeah, how to, make, how to mad, <laughs> make that time for yourself. My equipment so that I can stall for time so I can think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, so anyway, the, the, but that's the main thing for me. The five touch bout, I want to figure out where my opponent's cutting. Um, and then if I figure that out, I can figure everything else out just you know, based on movement, you know, how I move, how I set up. I can I can throw a lot of different fake actions and make my opponent think a bunch of different things. But at the end of the day, I'm sitting on that cut. I'm mm-hmm. waiting for that cut. If I know where it is, you know, you have to lunge. Before, you know, before, before you cut, you have to lunge. That lunge is coming. I'm going to see you wind up. It's coming. Yeah. I'll wait all day long. If you want to hit me, you got to do it. So I can wait. I'll, I'll wait. I got one foot off the end of the strip. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. If I know you're cutting air, I'll just wait. Sooner or later, there's going to come that forward post. You might hit me my parade. You might take a counter post. Fine. But at least, you know, if I if if, if I get that forward, then at least I know, okay, I got that, that location. Mm-hmm. Later on, I can disguise it a different way. I can invite you, get you to come here and take forward post. I can make you fall short and pull my hand back while I'm attacking, you know, and, and get you to cut that. I can I – can, Work it out many different ways on how I get you to cut there, right. but I'll get you to cut. In fifteen touch bouts, I don't have that. Uh, uh, I don't have that. I'm not pressed for time, right? So in fifteen touch bouts, it's a little different. I try to get a lot more information from the simultaneous. So I want to know where you're cutting, how fast you're cutting, how many steps it takes you, uh, what particular steps. I like to count steps. I like to follow rhythms. Rhythms are very important. To me. Yes, they I are. know your rhythm. I know when to cut, right? So, so, so if you're going, bop, 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 that's double advanced lunch to me. Bop, 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 bop. Okay, no problem. I know after the second advance, that's when I gotta hit you. Mm-hmm. At ending your second advance, that's when I gotta lunge because that means my lunge will be ahead of your lunge, and a reasonable referee is gonna see that and is gonna give me the touch, right? Just in, in theory. So, if I've been hearing your footwork, bop, 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 bop. Ready, fence. Ba 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 ba. No problem. The next time it's ba 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 ba. My arm's coming out, right? Or I'm lunging after that second advance, or or toward the end of that second advance, mm-hmm. so that I can do a half tempo ahead of you, a half a step ahead of you. Um, if I don't get the touch, then you know, and, my, and the referee doesn't see that, or just has a wide box and decides to call simultaneous, or calls it against me, says attack on attack, and I'm, because I'm late, then I have to make an adjustment. Maybe I have to. Do it after the first advance, yeah. Or maybe I need to take off the line first. I, I, you know, I can make those adjustments as necessary. But generally, if I figure out your rhythm and I'm a half a step ahead of you, with most quality referees, I'll get the touch. Once I've established that early on, forget it. Everything else, like everything else, I just know you're gonna cut straight. You don't want to get hit in preparation. You're gonna cut straight. You have to. And yeah. You have to cut straight. Yeah. So if you cut straight. I'm thinking two things. I'm either thinking blade parry pose or distance and long attack. You know, one or the other. Like, and if I know where you're going to cut, then I'm going for blade parry pose. And if I don't know where you're going to cut, then I'm going for distance. But either way, you're going to cut straight. And if you cut straight, I can get you to fall short. Once I get you to fall short, it's a matter of me landing my attack. So, so that's my game plan early on. I, so I gather as much information as I can, how quickly you're moving, where you're cutting, get all that information, one simultaneous, maybe two simultaneous, at the at the max, mm-hmm. and then I and then I'm off to the races with the act. I'm going for parry. I'm going for attack and preparation. I'm going for distance. I'm going for sky hook. I'm going for invitation. You know, and if and if you fall into my web of actions, I'm you know at that point if I'm up four one five one you know or five zero whatever it is. Now when I get to the point where I've exhausted everything, just go back to the beginning because at the end of the day. What's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to hit your opponent. To hit your opponent, what do you have to do? You have to cut. Every cut by an opponent, it's a potential parry pose. If you go in with that mindset, you know, after I finish doing all those different actions, I can start all over from the beginning and just set it up different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, I can start everything in a five. I can start everything with a false contact. I can start everything from a point of line. I can start everything going back. I can start everything running forward. But the idea, but the ideas for the actions are still the same. The setup is different, so it's my opponent. It looks like I'm doing several different things, but I'm really just going 
right back to the same basic actions that everyone uh, uh, is taught. So, but the but the key the key is all implement imp- implementation, having the guts to to go for it, not being afraid to lose. Um, That's important. And and thinking your way through the whole. Yeah. That's very. I mean, it's so important. You know, when when you see, you know, um, I was actually going through a bout, uh, an, inter- an international bout, um, with my students the other day, and we were looking at a situation where one friend was up by a lot of touch, and then the next thing you know, he's down by two or three touches, and then you saw at some point. He lost confidence because he he wasn't getting the the actions he was going for, and some of the other ones weren't working because he was off by a foot or two, and his confidence went down. As his confidence went down, all of a sudden you saw none of the actions were working. He started falling short, and 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 ruined. He lost the bout. So you know it's very important in a fifteen touch bout if you feel that you're about to lose that rhythm, and you you know you just scored four or five in a row, but now your opponent just scored the last two or three in a row. So you went from like a five touch lead to now a three touch lead or a two touch lead. It's mm-hmm. very important to stop. Just stop. Yes. You know, find something, find something justifiable to the referee to stop. Tie his shoelaces. You know, fences. If you have long hair, stop. I gotta fix my hair. Whatever it is, you know, some referees are good at, at preventing that from happening. Some aren't. If you got the referee that's not good at preventing it, then take your time. Figure out. You know, fake an injury. You know, people uh, fake an injury. You know, people say you can't do that. You know how many times I faked injuries? Man, I walk around limping and have people thinking, oh, my ankle, oh. man, look that thing. Look, you get an injury timeout, they always say, well, if you if you fake the injury and we determine that there's no injury, you're going to get a car. Yeah, I understand that. I know the rules, okay? How are you going to tell me I'm not injured? Yeah, exactly. I feel no pain, I feel pain. <laughs> I feel pain. Maybe you've determined there's no injury, but I feel pain and I'm limping, mm-hmm. right? What do you have to do? Because at the end of the day, you spend money, an entry fee, going to this competition. And if you need time to think, you got it. You need to think. So do what you have to do to get that, that time to think your way through the body. I faked injuries, man, and I'm sitting there, and I got people working on my leg, and ain't nothing wrong with me. All I'm doing is sitting there thinking. I've broken body cord on purpose just to change the body cord. Sna- oh, look, it snapped. I got to change. And and I'll, I'll literally have somebody tying the body cord, someone else tying the other one, pulling it through my arm, and I'm the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, thinking, thinking thinking you know hopefully my opponent is not thinking <laughs> you know that's what i'm hoping for um you know and i'm just thinking how am i going to get the rhythm the momentum back you know how do i get the momentum back sometimes it's psychological sometimes it's not even strategic right yep. sometimes it's psychological sometimes it's it's well my opponent just has the the the, the momentum right now Right, they're just feeling it right now. I don't. And sometimes think... that break is what'll stop that and allow the tables to turn, and so that I can get the momentum. I can kind of steal that momentum from them, exactly. Slow them down, and then come out fired up, and then kind of take it back. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people understand how much momentum helps people in the sport. When I get a run of touches, like three or four touches in a row, I just want to get back on guard really quickly because. Or... Yeah. You don't want to give the other person any chance to like wiggle out of the grip that you've got on them. And Absolutely. like when you when you've scored like four or five touches in a row, that is not the time to tie your shoe or fix your blade. You just no. just get you on guard. Keep going. You don't want to take a break? <laughs> no, I, I I see that happen all the time. Like someone someone is up like has just gotten like four touches in a row and they're like, Can I fix my blade? And as a spectator, I'm like, What are you doing? Like you're <laughs> save you're save that for blade. later. Yeah. You don't need to fix your blade. And conversely, and conversely, when people lose a couple touches in a row, I see them just getting back on guard. Just get like, back on guard. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Slow down. Yeah. That's the rush. Absolutely. And that's the so, yeah. that's one of the things I tell people all the time. Is like the first thing is like when when your opponent gets on a run of touches, even just like two or three in a row. What is your response to that? And if it's get back on guard, you're not giving yourself a chance to think and like realize what's happening to you. And of course, you're going to keep losing touches. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I also, I mean, you know, I, I, this might sound a little bit, I might sound a little bit of a jerk when I say this, but but I but I you know I gotta be honest. Like I really think it's difficult for someone who didn't compete to be to to be able to 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 coach that. Right. Yeah. Like if you, didn't, you don't know what it feels like to be in that situation on a high level, how are you gonna explain that to someone who who's going through that? Right. You know yeah. What I, mean? I totally so, understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, like, 
I love my coach, man. Yuri Goldman, that was, that was my coach, right? Yuri, Yuri, Yuri's my coach from 1995 to 2008. For 13 years, I, I, I was a student, you know? And Yuri started coaching young. Like, he didn't compete on a super, super high level for years and then stop and start coaching. He, he's been coaching for, like, a long time, like, yeah. 40 years. So, you know, like... I remember sometimes when I'd be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stress, I'd be stressed out in a competition, stressed out. I mean, you couldn't tell on my face, but I, but he knew I was stressed out. And he, he would, you know, he was like, I right, don't be nervous. Like, what do you mean? Don't be nervous. Yeah. I'm nervous. I can't, I can't, I can't help that. You know, oh, I'm going to be nervous. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, never, I never thought of that. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but, but, but Peter Westbrook always told me, he said, he would tell me like, you're going to be nervous. You mm -hmm. have to be nervous. If you're not nervous, something's wrong, you know. And I never thought about it that way until he explained to me. So listen, he said, nervousness is just your mind telling your body that this counts. Yeah. You know, nervous. So everybody's nervous at a tournament. Everybody. So your coach is nervous. The fences are nervous. The referees are nervous. Every, he's, he's, everyone's nervous. Yep. You know, the only people who aren't nervous are like the the people cleaning up or like the people who <laughs> se setting up and breaking down the strips. The armorers, like they, you know, they're not nervous. The vendors, they're not nervous. Like yeah. what are they? Right. But anyone who's competing, who's actually in that pod, yep. is nervous. The referees nervous. They don't want to make a mistake, right? The coaches are nervous. They want their kids to win. The defense, obviously, the defense is nervous. Everyone's nervous. He said, if, this, if if you're not nervous, then then you're either like drunk, high, or dead, or insane. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Brain damaged. So so um. He would just tell me, like, accept the fact that you're going to be nervous. It's okay. It's okay to be nervous. Just mm -hmm. control them. That's all. You know, I'm nervous, but I got to take this parry post. Just say, I got to take this parry post. As opposed to, you know, psyching yourself out so much that you lie to yourself and you think that you're okay when you're really not. You know, then all of a sudden you start to go for parry. Then you're like, you're up here as opposed to down here, you know, because you're, because you're lying to yourself and not accepting the fact that you're nervous. So uh, I really think having a competitive background really helps in terms of explaining that to younger fans, that mm -hmm. it's okay to be nervous. You're going to be nervous. But you have to understand that your opponent could be 10 times more nervous than you. And if they don't know how to handle the nerves, they don't know how to calm their nerves and stay on in control of the nerves and still have them have the mindset to execute that you can beat them. Yeah. Right? So, so, so you know, I... I think I think it's really really important, uh, especially for young coaches, to have that competitive experience. And if you don't have that experience, find someone who does and have that person explain that to your students because it's so important. Like one thing I explain to my students, you know, and they're they're all young, they're all you know, junior high school, high school age, uh, you know. And I tell them, I said, listen, you're going to be nervous. You have to accept that. Mm -hmm. you can't you can't go into it thinking, you know. Uh, uh, I'll be fine. No, there's nothing wrong with being confident. But if you lie to yourself and deny the fact that you're going to be nervous, you're going to lose all your bouts. <laughs> I'm yeah, telling yeah. you that right. You're going to lose to that kid who is, who's controlling his nerves and he's going in there like he has nothing to lose. You'll lose to that kid, right? You have to accept the fact that you're going to be nervous. Yeah. Control your nerves and say to yourself, so I'm nervous, I'm stressed out, but I got to take a parry pulse. Because now is the time to take the parry post. If I think about it logically, now is the time to take parry post. Take the parry post and go for it. Yeah. And once you go for it, it kind of helps build your confidence a little bit and kind of bring that tension down. You know, bring that nervousness down a little bit so that you can execute. And honestly, it, once you've competed on a high level, you realize that being nervous actually helps. Yeah, it can. Right? It, it helps. It helps make that lunge just a little bit sharp. It helps make that parry post. It's a little bit faster. It helps you make that pull that distance just a little bit further, right? It helps you reach on that long text a little bit longer. So, you know, that nervous energy, if you use it properly, um, it, it helps uh, just put a little bit of extra oomph in every action, mm -hmm. which is a lot of times what you need to score touches, right? So yeah. um, there is a psychological component to it that I think, you know, unfortunately a lot of coaches are not prepared to address but the few that are, you see, because they're building armies of champions. You can tell. And, and, and I tell it all the time. I said, listen, you know, teaching someone how to fence, I don't think it's that difficult, right? Teaching someone how to fence. Just, you know, this is how you advance. This is how you retreat. This is how you learn. Like, if you learn how to do it properly and you're a patient person, you can teach someone how to do the actions properly, mm -hmm. right? 
But teaching someone how to compete. Yeah, it's hard. That's a completely different story. Yeah, totally. That's and, and that's why when you look at when there's certain coaches and you see that you see that 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 they're building champions by the power. It's not it's not that all of a sudden they, all their kids are just stars in the making and everyone else. No, there's something that they're teaching in terms of com- competition and competitive spirit, competitive energy, uh, competitive intelligence that they're teaching that other coaches are. Yeah, totally. Right? Because a lot of talented, physically gifted fencers lose their bouts yep. all the time. Yep. Never. And then I see fencers who have no physical talent or very little physical talent and, and they beat everybody. So there there is something to be said about the ability of a, of a coach to to train his or her fencers to compete and compete on a high level. So that psychological uh, uh, part to the, to, to the bout is so important. I think it's very important for coaches to have that know-how. And it's very hard to have that know-how if you don't have the competitive experience. Yeah, totally. So I want to ask you a question about building a 15-touch bout against someone who does not have a predictable rhythm. So say oh, that, oh gosh. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so say you're you're fencing someone who is is very good at mixing up the timing of their steps, and mm-hmm. your first couple of attempts to pick up on that rhythm have not worked, and you're down like four zero or five one or something. You take your time out during that time. How are you thinking about how you want to change what you're doing? Yeah, that that is so tough, right? So generally, when you when when I'm when you're you know, because there's some people out there that they're they're good, they're smart, and they react to nothing. Yeah. Right? So you do a false contact, you most people will lunge. You do a false contact with this person, and yeah, <laughs> right. It's kind of like the matrix. You know, yeah, yeah. rhythm is all over the place. That and but for whatever reason, as soon as you counter attack, boom, they finish. Right? They they see that clearly. Um. And so those are difficult. Those are difficult situations. Um, what I generally do with a fencer like that is um, I don't give them an opportunity to um, act. Right. So we have act, action, and reaction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, action is always faster than reaction. Yep. Right. Because I start, and you have to react to what I do. I have the advantage because I've already started before you did. Um, having a good reaction time is is an amazing ability. Right, it's I very important. don't have a great reaction time and stuff. You know, that, so I have to, to execute my actions premeditatively. I do everything premeditated. Most of the stuff, you know, most of what I do is premeditated. I I've already determined that you're going to cut here based on previous experience, or I'm going to set it up and make you cut there so that I can take the parry. Yeah, I'm not looking to see where you're going to cut. Ah, you know, I, I've seen and I've I've had teammates who had great reaction time. Aki Spencer, you know. Perfect example. Someone had amazing reaction time, right? He he'd be ah, one light. Oh my like, ah, god! How'd you see that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, he just his his hand eye coordination is impeccable um, as a fencer. Um, but mine isn't. So so you know, for me, if I'm fencing someone like that who's not reacting to any of my actions or any of my false actions, um, what I do is I take away the reaction from them right because i'm acting i'm doing false actions i'm trying to get a reaction out of them i take away the reaction from them i uh i'm sorry uh, yeah i take away the uh, i take away the action from them right i mean reacting to what they do i take away the action from them and i force them to react to what mm-hmm. I do. so and so when i get friends like that i don't let them attack i don't let them attack because if you're not going to fault my false actions but you're good enough to run me down every single time my defense is going to be completely pointless right so i i take away the, the attack from them. i initiate initiate i start forcing that person to react to what i do i want to see how quickly they react to it and i don't give them an opportunity to uh, react to what i do yeah. so i uh, you know i just take off do straight attack see let's see how fast your parry post is you know uh take off real fast attack with the point let's see if you can make me fall short you so know, i want to order put them on the plank and see what they're capable of doing. Yeah. So that, that actually reminds me of something I was, I was fencing Keith smart when, when I was in my prime and he had retired and there was like one night at the FC that he, he just came back and you, you might remember that he was very like, after he retired, he was very talkative and he'll like tell you everything that he was thinking and doing during the bout. So I, I was beating him badly at the break and Mm -hmm. 
after the break happened, the bout became much more competitive. And I think he ended up winning the bout like 15, 14 or something. And I was asking him about the adjustment that he made. And he, he told me like in the first half, you were attacking me really, really well. I couldn't figure out what to do with it. So in the second half of the bout, I just didn't let you attack at all. And Mm -hmm. if you're struggling with something that someone is doing, just don't give them the opportunity to do it. Like, you, you don't always you don't you don't always have to fight your opponent on their best actions. You can you can just take that action away from them and get that, away from them. Don't give them an opportunity to do it, and then and, and force them to do other things that they're not comfortable with. Yeah, and that times will be what psychologically what you need to to break them out of their comfort zone. And and yeah, and he and he's one hundred percent right. Um, uh, you know, we now have the advantage of having that minute break at eight. Yeah, when I start thing. <laughs> you know, I, I don't remember when when they started that. I'm trying to remember when they started that. They started that before '04. I want to say '01, maybe '02. Yeah. Sometime, I don't know. Sometime in between Sydney and Athens, they started that one minute um, break at eight. It was definitely between Sydney and Athens because I remember when I competed in the Olympics in '04, they had it. But uh, when I finished Junior Worlds in 2000, they didn't. So it was definitely sometime in between 2000 and 2004. Yeah. Um, but but when I first started fencing, we didn't have that. You did 15 straight. So you had to figure this stuff out on the fly. Right, you know, right. there was no break. And, and you know, and, and still, I get on four on that big fence. Because, like, you still have, you can still run the clock out and you still get a minute break, in, <laughs> you know, in between your periods. And, we, and when I started fencing, we were 15 straight. Yeah. So you had to figure that stuff out on the fly. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, getting back to the last point you made, you know, taking your, your opponent's best action away from them is sometimes all you need to get back into a bout. Yeah. You know, they're killing you on the attack or they're killing you on the parry post. Okay, that's your best action. I'm You're going to beat me on something else. I'm taking that away, right? So if I know your best action is, is parry post, my number one goal, do not cut straight. Force you to, I'm going to force you to beat me on counterattacks. You're gonna to have to counterattack me the whole bout. I'm not cutting straight. Yeah. Right? I'll I'll throw ninety different thousand stages, feints, beats. I'll cut in unconventional ways. You know, I'll, I'll do head feints and try to throw your timing off. Yep. But I will not cut you straight and fast. Yep. I will not. You know, um, if I know that that's what you're gonna to try to use to beat me. You know, if I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose on your second best action or your third best action. But it's not gonna be on your best action because my chances of now bringing uh, myself back into the bot go up. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, definitely taking taking uh, um, taking people's best a- action away. But when I fence someone who's got an unconventional rhythm, I usually just take off. I just take off of the box and force you. Because usually people with unconventional rhythms, they're good at not reacting to what you do, but generally they're not so great at reacting to what you do. Mm-hmm. So I just force them to, to react to me. Because if you want to get weird, I can get weird too. Like, yeah, I can, yeah. I Weird with her. You want to get like a funky rhythm and start cutting weird angles. I can do that too. So I'll just change my my mentality. I'm generally a defensive oriented fencer. I like to play defense a lot more than I play offense. Um, so if I get an opportunity to fence someone like that who doesn't react to my false actions, then then I'm going to be attacking all that you know throughout that bout. Yeah. So, so the answer to someone who has a, a rhythm that you can't figure out is just don't don't worry about their rhythm. Just make them worry about yours. Essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right. Very cool. Is there anything else you want to say about this? Um. Yeah. Uh, I. I think. Um. Another thing when, when we're talking about competition, I think. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that the last touch is the hardest touch to get. Um. You know, getting to fourteen, is 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 not as difficult as getting to 15. Right? Yes. And so what I usually do, and I do this all the time, for me, it's just my personal thing. I don't, I'm not telling, I'm not saying what works and what works for everyone, but what, what I do is I decide what I'm going to do on the last touch before the bounce starts. Hmm. And a lot of people, that's a little unconventional, but I've already made it my mind. And the reason why I do that is because a lot of fence, they get to 14 and then they take a deep breath. And that's the worst thing you can do when you get to 14 is take a deep breath. Because when you take a deep breath, you relax a little bit. And when you relax a little bit, you let your guard down. When you let your guard down, you give that opponent an opportunity to get back in the bout. Especially at 14-10, 14-11. Because that person now has their back up against the wall, and they have nothing to lose. Exactly, yeah. Everything. 
And and if you think fourteen ten is safe, uh, you're, you're about you know, to I, I, you're about I, to I lose that bout. <laughs> now that I was up fourteen ten and lost. Yes, uh, I lost fourteen ten at a World Cup uh, in Cuba to Dennis Bauer. This was two thousand three. Top eight in Havana. Ouch. I was missing Dennis Bauer. I was up 14 to 10, and I lost 15 14. And would you know, three Americans made that World Cup final that year? I I, I finished seventh. Adam Crouch finished eighth. Keith Smart took second in that World Cup. Keith ended up beating Dennis Bauer later on in that World Cup. I would have fenced Keith in the semifinal had I won that bout. And, uh, you know, it was just it was just one of those things, you know, and it was like, OK, that would have been my opportunity to, to like win a World Cup because, you know, Keith is someone that I could fence. I know how to fence him. Let's yeah, say I had to beat him that bout, you know, I would have fenced, uh, you know, Gail to you who ended up winning the World Cup, you know, and I beat him majority of my career. You know, so that was I was looking at it as an opportunity where I, I just lost my focus and I lost someone that I had beaten before. And it beaten since, you know, I had a, I have a good career record against Dennis Bauer, but you know, I lost my focus. I got to fourteen, and I was like, oh, I got this. I could win this yeah. tournament. Yeah. And and he had nothing to lose, and he just started going for actions, and he got right back in it, and I lost it, and lost the bout. And that was an opportunity for me to to to, to maybe win a medal, maybe win a World Cup. You never know. Um. So, um. Yeah, getting to fourteen. You know, it, it's it's not it's not the same as getting that last up. So what I always did was I'm going to decide when I get to 14, I've already decided what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going for when I get to 14, whether it works or not. If I get to 14, this is my action. Uh, and it's usually an action that, that it's, it's educated action. It's based on what I've seen throughout the entire bout. Um, 90% of the time it's parry post, not going to lie, <laughs> you know. Um, but well, how I'm going to set it up, I can figure that out. I can figure that out through the bout. Yeah, and I've already decided at fourteen. I'm going for parry post. How I set that up, I'll figure that out. Or I've decided at fourteen, fourteen. I'm going to go for a counterattack. Which one am I going to go for? I can figure that out throughout the course of the bout. Maybe at two, three, I'll try a skyhook to see if it works. Maybe at two, three, I'll try a point of line and a counterattack to the inside of the arm and see if it works. And then I'll abandon it. If it works, I'll abandon it and I'll bring it back at fourteen. When then thinking about something completely different, and I'll try it again. Boom! I'll come back to it later. Ah, you forgot. You know <laughs> things like that. Or I'll go for parry early on, and I might not try it again for six or seven touches. Try it again. Ah, work again. Good. Okay. Now I feel comfortable going for that at 14. When I get to 14, I'm going for it again. You know, so that way when I get to 14, I'm not going like this. <sighs> okay, I'm good now. No. Let's get this touch first before I'm good. I'm good when I get to 15. Yeah. So I think that that's also, and I've seen so many fences lose when they get to 14 and just can't finish. So I think it's very important to have a plan for when you get to 14 have an acting that you've already decided you're going to go for and and figure out how to implement it during the bout so that when you get there, you have your, your action ready. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the other things that goes along with that is a lot of people think about the touch at 14 is how do I win this bout instead of just like the rest of the bout, just how do I get this next touch? Sure, so. sure exactly. And, and yeah, and sometimes sometimes you have to score 17, 18, 20 touches to get to 15, right? You, you think you did the action well, your opponent did something better. You think you did the action well? The referee didn't see it that way. You think you did the action well? You slipped. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes you have to get more than fifteen to get to fifteen. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. You can't look at fourteen as one more. You got to look at fourteen as I, I got to get another two or three. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good way to do it too. Bounces if like you're going to twenty, it makes it a lot uh, uh, more manageable. Yeah, totally. All right, Ivan. Thank you so much for talking to me about this today. I think you got it, bro. I think time. this is a topic, especially that a lot of people are very weak on, and I think this is something that a lot of people will benefit from seeing. So, yeah, I, I hope so. I hope so because you know, I, I think, I think again, you know, just education. You know, I, I benefited from from having good people around me and knowledgeable people around me. You know, obviously, I had a great coach who who, who produced champions by the pound. Yeah, I uh, also had a great mentor who was able to 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 kind of get me to understand the psychological aspect. So I got the physical aspect, the psychological aspect, the technical aspect, the athletic aspect to it. Um, I've just been being around good people. So I, I had a very good education. I benefited from having a good education. And I think it it reflected in my in my body of work as a fencer. But, you know, for me to go to the grave with it would be uh, selfish. So I'm glad I had the opportunity to share with people. 
Yeah, awesome. I'll talk to you again soon. All right, bro. Take care. You too.